So there are more things happening in Daniel two, Daniel three, rather, as we ask, how do you love the truth? <clears throat> The people who were present were threatened with a furnace of burning fire. And there's just some things that have to be talked about. They're just powerful things. We mentioned earlier today that the Lord said, I'll tell you whom you should be afraid of. <laughs> there are fires that are worse than that fiery furnace. <clears throat> At the moment, I draw your attention to the fact that the three who are in trouble about the worship of the statue are Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the friends of Daniel, the ones who asked for kosher food, when they were brought over. So they are accustomed to taking a stand when it is a small thing and they are not going to change when it is a big thing. That's how it works. So Daniel 3, 12, the people came forward uh, to accuse these who are faithful servants of God saying, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, by the way, we happen to notice. <laughs> That's interesting. That's why they're being attacked, you know. <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. That's not true. They do not serve your gods. That is true. They do not worship the golden image that you have set up. That is true. So that's a pretty good mix. That's how the devil likes it. Some things are true. Some things are not true. That's how it usually works with him. That makes the best hook. Nebuchadnezzar went to these individuals with, is that true? He summoned them to his presence after all of the uh, fanfare of presenting the statue, bringing everybody together, you know, all that stuff. These three are called into the presence of the king. And the king is furious. <clears throat> Is it true? You do not serve my gods. You do not worship the golden statue. Well, it is true. They don't have to answer that. Now, if you're ready, stop right there for a moment. <laughs> do you see what just happened? The king said, Is it true that you don't serve my God, so you don't kneel to the statue? Is Nebuchadnezzar asking this because he doesn't know whether to believe the people who came to him? No, that's not what's happening. This is um, elevated executive speech. He is giving them a way out. Well, this report has come to me and doesn't seem to be consistent with your character. You don't believe this, do you? Oh, no, King, there must be some misunderstanding. Oh, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Right? That's what he's doing. Oh, that's not true, is it? So, you know, if you're ready... And we repeat the commandment as it had been issued, right? The details of the commandment. If you do this, well and good. I.e., I will overlook your momentary transgression. We, have, we will come up, we found a graceful way for you to get out of this. Which is to say, for some reason, and I think that we know the reasons in the past, they have some favor with Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't just want to throw them under the bus. He wants to give them a chance to save face and redeem themselves. So that's what's happening here. And I, I say that because it's important to understand. Um, 
none of these people are stupid, even though the king is very foolish. They're not stupid. This is very elevated dialogue at the level of the royal cabinet. So this is very much a chance for them to weasel out of it. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, this tells us something of Nebuchadnezzar's state. If it wasn't clear already when he made the statue and commanded the people to worship. It especially is clear when he says, and what God will deliver you, as in you think that you have something better. Which is, this is all very common language. You see the same language employed when the people are uh, besieged by Assyria um, and when they're besieged by Babylon the first time. You may recall when Hezekiah received some messages and he dealt with them as the Lord spoke. That messenger said very much the same things, which is, you know, none of the other countries have survived our siege. They all relied on their God, and they all thought their God was going to deliver them, but that never happens. Don't die like everybody else. That's what he said, and it's very common. And Nebuchadnezzar now seems to believe this, even though at one time he knew that God had put him in power and that God had given him those kingdoms that he hadn't done it by his own hand. There's more on that in the book of Daniel. But it's telling you, this guy really doesn't get it. He thinks that he's the scariest thing there is, and he's not. He is the scariest king on earth at the time, but he's not the scariest thing there is, because he's not God. Now, you're not allowed to tell him that. Because, <laughs> you know, people who think that they're God tend to get kind of mad when you'd say that they aren't. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Eh. He should already know, right? That's the point. Eh, we don't need to answer this. It, it doesn't matter. Right? There, there is a God, and he is powerful, and it doesn't matter what test you put in place or what you think that you are or what you do to us. That doesn't affect God who is and who was and who is to come, who is the all-powerful, the almighty. That's not going to change. That's not in the balance. God's not being judged. We're not deciding whether God exists, whether God is right. Nah, you don't get to decide such things. People don't decide that. This is what they mean by we have no need to answer you. This has no, this has no relevance to anything. It has no bearing on anything. This is not real. All this stuff is a figment of your imagination. It's basically the point. None of that is real. It doesn't matter what you and I do. God still exists. Let God be true, though every man be a liar. So the first thing they said was, it doesn't matter, King. What problem do you think you are solving? What question do you think you are addressing? What matter do you think you are settling? There isn't one. That's the first answer. And that comes from a place of faith. In Luke 12, Jesus said, I tell you, my friends, at verse 4, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. I am totally fascinated by Luke 12, 4. Just this whole, <laughs> this perspective really gets you. First time you read it and come to terms with it, I think, especially. But 
uh, even now I find this fascinating. Uh, don't be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have nothing more that they can do. After that, after, wait, you mean after you're dead? Yeah. Yeah, after that, there's nothing else they can do to you. You're dead. You're gone. You're out of reach. That's a very interesting perspective. As he's saying, death is not the worst thing that can happen. That's what that means. Death is not the worst thing that can happen. The world lives as though it is the worst thing that can happen. And the world's definitions of love revolve around that idea that there's nothing worse than losing your life. Human suffering in the way of the world's thinking is what is immoral. Nobody should suffer. So all of humanity's efforts are, you know, when, if they, uh, let me try that again. All of the human dictates of morality have to do with alleviating human temporal suffering. They think the good is to remove consequences. This is why European governments have legalized prostitution. In fact, they have state-sponsored prostitution. They provide health care and doctors, certification tests to the prostitutes, and they encourage the people to use these prostitutes because they think that they have removed all of the suffering, all of the consequences, you see? That to them is good because there are no consequences. But it's not good, it's evil. Should there be consequences? Well, sure. It, when, I was, when I was in school and thought about being a teacher, I remember being in class and, and then a discussion about should students feel bad? I, and I was that idiot, you know, who raised my hand and said, it depends. You know, everybody else said, no, they should never feel bad in a learning environment. I said, well, it depends. It depends on what? It depends on whether they've done poorly. If you fail to make an effort, if you're disrespectful, it, it, if you could have done better and you didn't, yeah, you should feel bad. That's bad. You should feel bad about that. Yeah. Man, I got murdered in that class. <laughs> but it's true. You should. The alleviation of human suffering is not the point of the church. It's not the point of the Lord. It's not what he came to bring. He came that we might be saved from our sins, that we might have forgiveness in heaven. But there's no promise about temporal consequences, about human suffering. That's not part of it. And so this teaching is, you know, there are people who can do all kinds of terrible things, and it's true. It's incredible what people are capable of. But, you know, they can kill the body, and once, the bo once you're dead, there's nothing else they can do. You know, that's it. That's all the power they have. That's true, if frightening. <laughs> but God on the other hand has all the power and all the authority on the other side of death for us everything that happens from there is in his hands in his control and that is the thing that lasts forever this life doesn't last forever you might think the sermon lasts forever but no, the fact is only our spiritual life is going to go on forever. And that is where God's power is. It outweighs anything else. Jesus said, be afraid of that. There are people who will compel you to do wrong. And there are people who will maybe even try to take your life or succeed at taking your life. Because of the gospel. That does exist. But you have to be more afraid of God than you are of them. 
because there will be consequences for sin. We will receive what we have done, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Everything will be brought into judgment. And is that frightening? Well, I think it is, and I think it should be. Getting too comfortable with that, I'm afraid, leads to laxity. Not the appropriate respect for the God of the universe. Now, with this in mind, look at the next verse of Daniel 3, verse 17. If this be so, as it, you know, if this is the deal you're extending us, Nebuchadnezzar, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. So, yeah, we don't need to answer you. He can do this. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. That's the God that you just asked about. What God can deliver you? Our God. Okay, he can do this. Which is to say, he has that ability. And it's true, God does have the ability to deliver us from all, ma all manner of suffering. To deliver us from temptations. And it's not wrong to pray for that deliverance. But you've got to understand that sometimes the answer to that request is no. Jesus prayed earnestly in the garden of Gethsemane that this cup might pass, and the answer to that was no. That's why Psalm 22 starts the way it does. My God, why have you forsaken me? It's precisely predicated on the fact that the answer to, to that prayer was no. This cup will not pass. You will go through this suffering. Okay, that's the deal. Which is why they said, our God is able to deliver us, and he will. But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you've set up. But if not, as in <laughs> he can save us, but we can't promise you that he will or will not, we don't know times that God has fixed in his own hand. When will I die? I don't know. Nobody knows when they will die. <clears throat> it's up to God. He is able to deliver us, but if he doesn't, be it known, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue. We, you know, that's just the way it is. It's the non-negotiable. And that's the way that the faith should be. The faith of Christ Jesus, the faith of God that you have is non-negotiable. You must do what God commands. It's immutable. It, it can't be changed. It can't be uh, fudged, moved, <laughs> blurred. He can save you from everything, but he may not. Will you still be faithful to him, even to death? Job is an example of this same attitude, and I would turn you there. Job 1. <clears throat> you may recall that this man was a faithful man, but he was beset by Satan. And Satan murdered all of his children and destroyed his livelihood. All means of making money for him were destroyed. His response to that is captured at Job 1, 21. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave. The Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah, I came naked, I'll leave naked. It's net zero, if you like it. <laughs> it's going to be net zero. But he said, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away too. True. Sometimes you, you're given things, entrusted with things. Sometimes you are not given things. Sometimes you have things that are taken away from you. That's in his purview. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is not doing wrong to bless you or to take away something that he had already blessed you with. He has his purposes. He has his reasons. In all this, Job did not sin 
or charge God with wrong. Right. And he, and, and he never did. <laughs> he maintained this throughout the narrative. In the second chapter, the devil visits him again and destroys his personal health. He's covered in sores. Horrible things have befallen him. The children died, but the wife did not, and now you know why. Job 2, 9, because Satan saw that she was useful. Not that all you wives are like this. I'm saying <laughs> somebody who was useful to Satan got to stick around so they could be a thorn in his side. His wife said, do you still maintain your innocence? Curse God and die. Why, you can't be innocent. Look at all the bad things that have happened to you. That's the way the world thinks. See, that's what we're getting at. We said earlier, the world has the wrong definition of love and the wrong definition of good. The world thinks all these bad things have happened to you. That's a clear sign that God is mad with you. But that's not true at all. The truth is, God was pleased with him. And Satan said, eh, he just serves you because you let him have everything. And God said, oh, take it. And he did. And Job still served him. That's what's happening. But yeah, she says, do you, do you still maintain your innocence? And, and that is the meaning here. I realize that Every translation says, do you still hold fast your integrity? Which is a phrase that nobody ever says in English. I've never heard anybody say that. Nobody knows what it means either. What it means is, do you still maintain your innocence? It's obvious you're not innocent. Look at all the suffering that's happening to you, Jesus. Oops, I mean Job. <laughs> Job is, you know, it's real. That happened, and this is an accurate record, but Job is a symbol of Jesus, you know. He's the mouthpiece for Jesus on the cross. When you're reading chapter 3 of Job, you're not reading, uh, you know, an old yank complaining about his health and his life, oy vey. You are hearing the words of Jesus Christ from the cross. Try it again. You'll see what I mean. It's definitely what this is about, okay? And it brings up all of the major theological questions. Why did he have to be born at all? Yes, maybe a life was required, but why did it have to be taken this way? It's really deep. But Job's response is, ah, you speak as one of the foolish women might speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? <laughs> he didn't say she was foolish. He said, this is not characteristic for you, my wife. But the real question, shall we receive good from God and not evil? We're willing to take the blessings, but we're not willing to take the trouble, the burdens, the difficulty, the work. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That is true, and that stays true. Matthew 27. The chief priests... The scribes and the elders mocked Jesus on the cross. It's Matthew uh, 27, verse 41. They mocked him. He saved others. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. No, they won't. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. So why is he dying like this? Why is God letting this happen to him if he's supposedly the son of God, right? Little did they know, they were almost verbatim quoting Psalm 22. It's almost verbatim, which 
it's also what Psalm 22 is about, by the way. That's the crucifixion. Did they say this to Jesus? Yes, they did. Were they right? No, they weren't. Did his death on a cross prove that he's not the king? Did it prove that he has not the power to save? Did it prevent people from believing in him? No. Does he trust in God? Yes, he does. Can God deliver him? Yes, he can. But will he? Not this time. Right? And 1 Peter 2, <clears throat> to this you have been called, verse 21, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile back. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He just kept entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. That's God. They reviled, they attacked, but he didn't fight back. He didn't threaten. He continued to trust himself to the one whose judgment is right. That's not going to be Nebuchadnezzar. His judgment is wrong. But they entrusted themselves to God, whose judgment is right. And though they were falsely accused, and though they were reviled, they entrusted themselves to the God who judges justly. And again, at the 21st verse of 1 Peter 2, leave you with that thought that to this you have been called because Christ suffered for you leaving an example that you might follow in his steps remember what Jesus said you must take up your cross daily and follow me deny self and take up your cross daily and follow me we've been called to this we we do we we have to leave the comforts of this world sometimes. No, obviously you don't die every day. You may never be killed for the faith. I hope that that doesn't happen to anybody that I know, but I can make no promises. We don't know what the future holds or what can happen to people or what situation you might find yourself in. We do know that God is right and that God is trustworthy and that our trust placed within him is well placed it is not misplaced even if we suffer even if we suffer great loss in the flesh in the spirit we are saved in the spirit we have peace as jesus said my peace i give not as the world gives we have peace with god and sometimes we have peace with men and those are good things, and we give thanks for that. But sometimes you don't, and that's a bad thing, but stay the course. Continue to be at peace with God. And that salvation guards your mind. And that peace with God allows you to make it through the suffering, in some sense to transcend what's happening here on earth, the way that the friends of Daniel were able to say, we have no need to answer you, these things are just not relevant to the questions that you're raising about who is God and whether God is powerful. That's just not in scope. Doesn't matter. But we are not going to sit. And if the consequence is our life, well, as Paul said, to depart is better. I'll be with him. Remember, he said that when he was in jail at Rome, looking at execution. He said, I don't know if I'm going to be preserved alive or, you know, will I glorify God, uh, the Lord by going about in the body teaching still or will I glorify God by giving up that body? I don't know. He said, I, you know, he almost said, I'd rather go. It's far better to be with Jesus. But to stay here is needful for you. That's what Paul said. 
Same kind of idea. You can have that way of thinking and you can have the peace that surpasses understanding. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? Become one. If not, we have the ability to do that in Christ Jesus because he died for the whole world. And you can be saved from the eternal fire, which is the real thing to be afraid of and the real God to be afraid of. We'll help you because we'll help you get to the water, the water to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. Today, if you are already a Christian and have not lived right, it is time to repent and reset your heart and reset your dedication to him. And we can help you with our prayers, too. If you need to obey the gospel or if you need the prayers of the saints, we invite you to come to the front while we uh, stand together.